Welcome to this edition uh, of Parallax Views, an IEA series of conversations about cultural politics and in particular freedom of speech. My name is Mark Lendenning, and today I'm hugely honoured to be joined by Yaron Brook, uh, chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute in America. Uh, this interview has been arranged at short notice because Yaron was due to be addressing a meeting at King's College this evening, but for reasons uh, that he will go into in a moment, uh, that meeting has had to be arranged at rearranged at very short notice, and so will now be taking place uh, once this uh, conversation uh, is over. So King's um, loss is our gain, and in particular, it's my gain because I have long been an admirer of Yaron and have seen and heard many of his uh, talks on the internet about the philosophy of, of objectivism and related uh, subjects, and we'll be coming on to that a bit later. Uh, before we come on to objectivism, sure. um, please tell me about the, the circumstances in which you <laughs> find yourself here tonight, because I, I find them very revealing, and they relate to a sort of horrific experience you had a few years ago. It, Kings. Yes, a few years ago I was doing an event with um, uh, the person known as Salgan Avakad. Uh, we were doing an event on free speech. It was going to be a conversation about free speech uh, between the two of us. The weekend before, there was some uh, chatter on the internet that some uh, Palestinian groups were complaining that I was uh, at uh, King's College giving a talk because I am pro-Israel, I'm known to be a, a, an advocate for, for, uh, for the Israeli position in terms of foreign policy. Um, but that developed over the weekend, and, and it seems like the protests were growing. King's College, as a consequence, uh, beefed up security. They restricted attendance at the event to only people, uh, only students. Uh, so a lot of people who had planned to come in by train from outside of London uh, were turned away at the door. Uh, and it, so we started the event. The event, uh, there was security. We were put in a separate room. We started the event, and about 10 minutes into the event, uh, there was loud bangs. Uh, uh, Antifa had jumped over whatever barriers they had put uh, to enter the college. They threw smoke bombs. They knocked the security down. One of the security guards landed up in hospital. And they rushed into the, into the room where we were having the event, and came up on the stage and grabbed the microphones and, and were, you know, uh, uh, making noises of violence, although they, they, they didn't do anything. Uh, ultimately, they were shooed out of there and, and they shut down the whole university because the smoke bombs set off their alarms and, and the event, of course, was canceled. Uh, since then, uh, King's College seems to be very, very hesitant to allow me on campus. Uh, with regard to this event, they demanded that the students pay for private security. Uh, to, uh, in order to hold an event with me uh, present. And of course, uh, King's College, while an extreme case, is not the only case uh, where this has happened. Uh, it's happened to me in, in the past at Exeter University, where again, a group of pro-Palestinian kids uh, wouldn't let me speak. Again, a talk on free speech. They stood up yelling slogans and for half an hour wouldn't let me say a word until security came, cleared them out, and allowed the event to go on. And then just a few weeks ago, I was at Bristol University uh, go, giving a talk on capitalism and the causes of war. And again, uh, students uh, claiming that I am Islamophobic, whatever that means, um, uh, came and as I started the event, they were banging on the doors, yelling and playing loud music over a, uh, a speaker they had received in order to try to disrupt the event as much as they could. So for whatever reason, I've gained a reputation here in the UK as some crazy uh, radical um, in, in terms of, uh, I don't know in terms of what. Uh, I don't think these people have actually read what I have to say about, um, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or about Islamic immigration to Europe. But uh, they've made me out to be some kind of monster and, and have uh, denied my ability to speak uh, or tried to deny my ability to speak at universities. Um, it's very shocking to hear that, obviously, from a liberal perspective. Um, and. I mean, have you experienced similar things in, uh, in America, similar acts of sort of barbarity uh, from 
the new left there? So, so I have over time. It, it's been a while, so it's interesting. The last few years, most of what I've experienced has been here in the UK um, and, and less so uh, in the United States. I think there's more... I think students here care more about kind of the, the foreign policy issues, issues around maybe Islam and issues about around Israel than they do uh, than they do in the United States. So I think that maybe is the motivation. But some of the other speakers uh, have experienced this, uh, uh, this idea of making noise outside the door. I've seen videos of, of um, Jordan Peterson having to having to deal with that and, and other speakers we, we all know, well-known speakers, not particularly crazy in my view, uh, uh, have been banned from campuses or not allowed to speak or, or been attempts have been made to disrupt it, them um, during speech. So this is this is a, a, a pattern. It's, you know, COVID has slowed things down. So for two years, we weren't on mm -hmm. campuses speaking. Now that we're back, it seems like the new left is alive and well and uh, actively involved in trying to silence points of view they don't like. Um, broadening the conversation out a little bit, um, how does the contemporary hard ultra left in America groups like an Antifa, Black Lives Matter, and that, those kind of groups, how do they relate to mainstream Democratic Party politics? Because it does sort of seem to me extraordinary that the party of JFK, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and, and what have you, now has people like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and these kind of people who are sort of ill-defined but ultra-left, sort of verging on Marxism, uh, but not in a very specific or intellectually persuasive way. Sure. I mean, how, sure. how, how, how are they becoming sort of concertina well, uh, it do, it doesn't, each other? It doesn't really surprise me. Uh, so, so the new left, the, 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 the AOCs of the world, are coming to become more and more important and more and more dominant within the, Repub the Democratic Party. Um, and, and the Democratic Party has taken a shift to kind of these new left positions, uh, it, which doesn't really surprise me. Uh, it, it's something that I think Ayn Rand predicted uh, in the 1960s would ultimately happen. The JFKs, the LBJs, uh, Johnson, uh, the F even the FDRs, um, whatever they represent, they don't represent anything principled. Uh, they present some mushy welfare state mixed economy position that doesn't really have any principles and any really guiding lights. I mean, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy was a known pragmatist who didn't really stand for anything substantive. When you when you have an environment in where the the, the consensus is kind of wishy washy, neither here nor there, that is incredibly vulnerable for people who actually believe in something even something really bad, to start tilting people in that direction. Um, uh, long-term uh, ideas are what matters. Long-term, it is the radical positions, the, mo the more consistent positions that win out. The, the mixed economy is not sustainable. The mixture will either move towards more authoritarianism or towards more freedom. And I think what we've seen in the Democratic Party is this mixture of some freedom, but a lot of constraints, and certainly in the economic sphere, a lot of regulations and controls and, and redistribution of wealth and so on, this mixture in the Democratic Party has led to those advocating for more controls and more consistent controls to dominate uh, and to dominate and to move the Democratic Party towards a more kind of authoritarian uh, positioning. I think they've done the same thing on the right. Uh, you know, the kind of the party of, I don't know, Richard Nixon and, and certainly the Bushes, which stood for nothing. Right, stood for vaguely free markets, but never, no, not too seriously. And it's, you know, cutting taxes. The one thing the Republicans have always been good at is cutting taxes, but not in the name of liberty or freedom or anything like that, because they never cut spending and they never really deregulate. And, and of course, that mishmash, that inconsistency, that unprincipled position opens Republicans up to the kind of, I'd say, new right which is much more nationalistic and much more fascistic and much more uh, authoritarian. So I think both left and right are moving towards uh, authoritarianism, uh, different brands of authoritarianism, as a consistent application of uh, you know, uh, the underlying ideas that, that are behind each one of uh, the left and the right. In that sense, 
I don't like that spectrum anymore because what we're seeing is collectivism of the left and collectivism yeah. of the right, and people like us and don't belong anywhere near there. We're like on a different dimension, and, and the political dimension I like is collectivism versus individualism, uh, with much of the collectivism of the left and right on the collectivist side, and, and the few of us who still stand for individualism on the other side. So in a way, what you're describing is very much what Hayek was uh, writing about in the context of the Germanic world when he wrote his famous book, The Road to Serfdom, where he argued that actually fascism and um, hardline socialism, which were generally seen as being polar opposites, in fact, he saw fascism as being the logical outcome of a very heavily regulated uh, socialist uh, economy and society, and that the real continuum is between liberals at one end and various forms of collectivist at the other. Absolutely. So I agree with that completely. And more than that, I think Hayek was also right in the sense that uh, he kind of talks about the slippy slope in the road to serfdom. That is, what, you know, once you give in a little bit, once you concede some of the collectivist agenda, once you concede to them, then you concede more and more and more because the more consistent party, again, which are the, you know, a little bit of collectivism yeah. versus a lot of collectivism, the a lot of collectivism, the fascists and the socialists are more consistent about their collectivism than this mishiwashi middle ground of a mixed economy. And, and uh, so there's a slippery slope that once you set, once you go the JFK route, or once you go the Richard Nixon route, the left is going to become more collectivist and the right is going to become more collectivist because neither the Nixon, the Republican Nixon or the Republican Bush or the, the, the Kennedy, neither one of them uh, stand for individualism, stand for liberalism in its, in its proper conception. Yeah. Um, what's interesting about the, the current political uh, scene, uh, both in your country and here, is, is the way in which uh, cultural politics uh, has now uh, moved to the, the the front of the stage, uh, so to speak. And in particular, uh, and this is something I associate much more with the new left um, than than the right. Um, a, a particular obsession with language and the desire to regulate, control language, prevent people like you from even uh, speaking. What, what do you think philosophically lies behind this? Yes, well, uh, you know, so what lies behind it is a rejection of the idea that reason is the mechanism by which we discover truth. That reasoned debate, reasoned argument, is the way in which you convince other people and using our mind, our senses, and our reasoning capability is the way we discover truth about the world. Uh, to one extent or another, they believe either in a complete subjectivism or some kind of way in which truth is revealed to them by, by some mechanism. They know it, maybe it's through their racial identity or maybe it's through their intersectional identity, depending on kind of who you talk to on the radical left. But once they have that truth, since they didn't achieve that truth through a reason mechanism, there's no way for them to explain it to us. And therefore the only reason they can, the, the, the only way they can get us to come along is by using force, right? And this is this is all totalitarianism, right? I, you know, the communists can't actually explain to us why we should all be sacrificed, why we should all be killed in the name of the proletarian, right? They, they, there's no reason why the proletarian should rule and the and the dictatorship of the proletarian should arise, or what even is the proletarian? Who are the proletarian? How do they make decisions? They, the, because again, they get that through some kind of revelation, and they get it through. The only way you get revelation really is through a leader like Stalin or, or Lenin who sees the truth, right? And they have to use violence. Uh, the, the fascists, how do they know what the Aryan race wants? Well, they get it. You know, somebody has to lead the Aryan race and have the revelation. Yeah. And he can't explain it to us because he didn't get it through reasons. So he has to use force against us. The new left is the same way. How do they know that this intersexual pyramid is the right intersexual pyramid? Not through reason, not through fact, not through logic. And once you abandon fact, reason, and logic, you're left with force. So you're left with silencing people who are trying to use logic and reason to object to your stance. Uh, you, you're left with trying to enforce your beliefs on other people through force. 
force. And that's, you know, it, it, that's why philosophically, the thing we must fight for is reason and truth. The idea the truth exists, the truth, there is a truth, there is objective reality, and that the only way to know it is through reason. And if it is through reason, and if there is objective truth, then I should be able to show you, I should be able to explain it to you, I should be able to argue about it, and I might be wrong, and, and we can have that debate, but using the tools of logic, not a fist. Yeah. And it's when you abandon logic, when you abandon reason, a fist comes into the picture. So they're, they're taking us, all, all these different types of authoritarian, are taking us back to a really pre-enlightenment period when at one point, you know, it was the Catholic Church or exactly. some other uh, religious organization saying, we know the truth, and if you don't go along with it, we're going to burn you alive and torture you. Um, in, and in a, you have to sort of, you have to subjugate your own uh, consciousness yes. uh, to the priesthood uh, or to whoever it is. And in a way, what we're seeing now is a reversal of this incredible uh, liberating period that was brought into being by the Renaissance, by, by the Enlightenment, whereby individuals were then became free to utilize their own Absolutely. cognitive capacity. And now we seem to be going back with these people. Well, I would us. say that what has happened over the last 200 years, really, since the Enlightenment made these ideas explicit and actually created a political system to manifest that, which is a free political system, whether it's American or whether Western European political systems that are, that are, that are, that are free and respect uh, free speech because they recognize that reason is the only means to achieve and therefore argumentation is the only means to achieve to achieve truth. But what we've seen is, is really from the beginning of the Enlightenment, certainly from the beginning of the 19th century, that is the, the end of the intellectual Enlightenment, what we've seen is a rebellion against it. Whether it was conservatives in the 19th century, particularly German conservatives, who, who, who resented the idea of individuals having opinions and individuals coming up with their own ideas and individuals uh, leaving the, the wonders of the farm to go to the city and be engaged in capitalism, or whether it's ultimately communism and Marx rejecting rejecting the Enlightenment, or even Kant and Hegel. Hegel is, a, is massively rejecting the Enlightenment in, in his philosophy. But we see, coming out of Germany in particular, but also out of France, a real opposition to the Enlightenment thinking. And I'd say <coughs> the rise of communism and the rise of fascism in Europe are these pre-Enlightenment ideas rebelling against the Enlightenment. So they're new forms of sort of counter-Enlightenment. Constantly I mean. we're seeing counter-Enlightenment in, in, yeah. in the West. And we're constantly having to fight back against the counter-Enlightenment. And unfortunately, the Enlightenment left a lot of holes philosophically that are being exploited by these counter-Enlightenment forces. And one of, I think, Rand's contributions here is that I think she is the Enlightenment philosopher of the 20th century. So she is... She helps fill in the holes that the Enlightenment created that the, the Enlightenment philosophers didn't fully articulate. For example, the Enlightenment philosophers, many of them were, were, were quite religious, and, and she kind of brings a secular perspective and a secular foundation for a lot of these ideas. Uh, and, and, but we're constantly, and I think she provides us with tools to now con continue the fight against the pre-Enlightenment ideas uh, but this is, this is the fate of the West, or the fate of the world now, because Western ideas dominate the world. It's this constant battle between the Enlightenment and the pre-Enlightenment. And, and, and in that sense, most of these ideas have a religious tinge to them, right? Communism had a religious tinge to it. Fascism certainly had a religious tinge to it. And you're seeing this new left ideology, and I'd say populism on the right, both have religious aspects to them, a priesthood. What, what, what do you mean by, by religious? Because, I mean, many of the sort of modernist authoritarians um, of the 20th century, whether they were fascists or Marxists, would certainly have said that they, they didn't, you know, uh, hide against it, you know, it was certainly sure. even God. Um, so they replaced God. by religion? So they so re so replaced God with another mystical entity. So communists replaced yeah. God with a mystical entity called the proletarian. Right. It's consciousness. And how do we know what the, again, we need a leader to, to tell us. We need a pope to tell us what the proletarian wants. Fascism replaced God with the Aryan race or whatever, or the nation, right? Nationalism places the nation above the individual. And again, the nation is kind of a mystical entity you see it in Putin right now uh, you know the nation has kind of the Russian spirit has kind of a mystical entity and you need that powerful 
leader mm. to be able to tell you what is good for the nation and what you should do for the nation. And I think the new left has, in a sense, this mystical entity, this this knowledge that somehow they have accessed. But it's it's fundamentally anti-reason. And when you don't have reason, what's left? You have left emotion. And I would say that at, at the end of the day, religion is based on emotion. It's, it's the end of the day, it's based on this truth as revelation, truth as coming, since there's nothing to reveal, it's ultimately the emotion. And uh, so I think that the, the, all these se- supposed secular movements, by rejecting reason, are left with emotionalism. And the and state, in that and sense, the state becomes a kind of uh, an omnipresent, all-powerful agency that kind of replaces God. Yeah, so yeah. Whether it could be the state. It fixes or it, everything. Or it could be the intellectuals, right? Yeah. It could be, it yeah. could be the, 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 the intellectuals that tell you which group today you have to sacrifice to, right? Which group today is at the top of the hierarchy of, of, of need and therefore uh, that the, the requires your sacrifice. But note that they've taken, in a sense, they've taken Christian morality. They've taken the morality of sacrifice. They've taken the morality of the neediest in society need your help, or a group that they define as the neediest. Again, whether it's the proletarian, we must all sacrifice for the proletarian, or whether it's the Aryan race, we must all sacrifice the Aryan race, or whether it's transgender, uh, you know, uh, uh, minority, ethnic, this, that, or the other, that we must all sacrifice to. There's always a group where morality demands that we give up our rights, give up our freedoms for their sake. And that, again, I think is religious, is, is religious based. Uh, you, all these people are put up on a cross as, as, as some kind of ideal that we must live, that we must sacrifice to. Um, Ayn Rand, towards the end of her life, um, while she was primarily, I suppose, fixated in terms of promoting the cause of liberty against more traditional forms of collectivism. Towards the end of her life, she, she did write a book about the emerging uh, new left, and it would be fascinating, would it not, to, to, to see how, had she lived on, she would now be uh, evaluating um, movements such as transgenderism and, uh, and all the other stuff that now comes under the, the, the sort of collective umbrella of, of the new left. How, how do you think she would be looking at the kind of developments we've seen in America? I mean, again, hard, hard to tell. She was a genius, I am not. So she would have had profound things to say that I can't even imagine. But she was already writing about this in the in late 60s and early 70s. Uh, she was writing about, in a sense, balkanization, the elevation of ethnicity as some kind of elevated, wondrous thing that we should be promoting. And she, she talked about balkanization before we saw this slaughter in the Balkans in, in the 1990s, right, when Yugoslavia fell apart. She was already predicting that based on this idea that we were elevating the ideal of ethnic groups, both within the United States and globally. Uh, she saw the rise of environmentalism as, as, as a phenomenon of the new left, and, and she talks in one of her essays, Apollo versus Dionysus, about the difference between kind of the Woodstock new left attitude to what life, which was the rejection of reason, the elevation of emotion, versus the Apollonian view of life, which was represented by the, the, the flight to the moon, which represented reason and the use of science and reason. And she said the world, unfortunately, is drifting towards this, uh, this Dionysus view, this view of emotion. So if you combine kind of the ethnicity with emotion, I think that's what we're seeing today. We're seeing little groups who express their emotions that have no, uh, no connection to reason, deny the efficacy of reason. The whole postmodern movement, which basically says there is no truth, there is no logic, none of that matters. Uh, I, I think all of that would be completely consistent with what we saw back then. It, there's a sense in which the hippies of the 1960s were the new left. They, um, they failed, and the primary failure was in 1972, and politically, if you think about McGovern, yeah. who was a clearly new left candidate and real authoritarian and a real statist, a real socialist, he failed dramatically against a very mediocre Republican, uh, Richard Nixon, but he was crushed by Nixon. That kind of put the new left on the side. On the side, and what happened to those hippies is mo- many of them became university professors. And what we're seeing today is the result of 40, 50 years of these uh, new left hippies of the 60s educating uh, multiple generations 
in this uh, philosophy of emotionalism, of rejection of truth and rejection of reality and rejection of reason, and we're reaping the, 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 the evil consequences of their dominance of our educational institutions, primarily in the United States, and then the exportation of those ideas to the rest of the world. So there's a sense in which everything we're seeing today have its roots in the 60s, and of course, uh, really have their roots, I would say, in, in German romantic philosophy, going back to Immanuel Kant. Yeah, a, a Labour Party friend of mine um, believes, but he's very much on the sort of traditional social democratic wing of his uh, party, but he, he believes that the new left are what he calls a proto-fascistic movement in that, just as you say, they're, they're elevating the politics of emotion uh, and that this is a sort of primitive politics, which is also uh, a, a tribalistic uh, movement whereby society is being analysed in terms of groups rather than individuals who have rights. And so that the new left is creating, through their theory, these categories, these identity groups that don't actually exist in reality. Absolutely, and, and, and it, you know, groups generally don't exist in the sense that only individuals exist. We can conceptualize people into groups, uh, but they are elevating the group above the individual, which all collectivists have done throughout history. Uh, but I, I would tell your friend that he's at blame. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the Social Democrats that are to blame for this appearance on the left. Look, the Social Democrats have forever wanted to, in a sense, enslave us economically. They want to control us economically. They want to tell us what we can and cannot do economically. And generally, they've said, what you do in your private life, we don't want to intervene. You can have that. You can do what you want. Indeed, it was the right, at least in America, who said, you know, in, in your economic realm, you can do what you want, but in the bedroom, we want yeah, to control want. you. But what's happening, what's happening today, and by the way, that's because each one viewed what was important, like the Marxists believe in the material world. So they want to control the material world. They don't care about the spiritual world because they don't believe in it. So they just want to control the material world, which means economics. The right believes in the spiritual world. They tend to be religious and they want to control the spiritual world. They don't care about the economics. That's just, that's just a this worldly, ugly kind of phenomena. So you can do what you want. That's the reason you have that split right. between Republicans and Democrats. But what is happening today on both sides is you're seeing more consistent people. So people on, the, on this new left are saying, wait a minute, if you guys think that it's okay to control people materially through economics, why shouldn't we be able to control people spiritually as well? And spiritually and in the linguistically. sense- And linguistically. Well, and that's yeah, linguistically. Yeah. Linguistically is spiritually. Yeah. So we want to be able to get into the bedroom and tell them what they can and cannot do and how they should be, shouldn't behave. And we want to get into issues like gender and so on. And we want to use the same tools you used in economics force, coercion, authority, authoritarianism to, in, to impose our views about these other issues as well. And on the right, what you're seeing is, you're seeing the populace come into the right and say, well, you wanted to control the bedroom and all of that, fine, but why can't we control the economy? Shouldn't we also control the economy? Ultimately, the economy uh, you know, affects these spiritual values as well. So you're seeing both left and right completely abandon freedom. The, the, the left used to stand for freedom of, of speech and, free, um, and, and spiritual freedom. They've abandoned that. They're purely authoritarian. The right used to stand for economic freedom. They've abandoned that. They're purely authoritarian. And what you've got today is the dominant trends on both left and right, at least in the US and I think to some extent here, is the authoritarians are winning on the left and they're winning on the right. And there is nobody on the political spectrum, standing for liberty. So the, 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 what, we, what we call the classical liberal point of view is not represented today on the, in politics. I mean, who is a classical liberal politician in America? It, one or two maybe you could find, maybe there's a couple in the House and a couple in the Senate, but that's it. They, you, you certainly can't identify that with Republicans or Democrats. They both abandon whatever elements of pro-liberty and pro-freedom they used to have they've abandoned them completely in the name of authoritarianism. So this brings me to my last question. Uh, what do you believe it is uh, that uh, liberals um, should now do? How, how should we further our, uh, our beliefs? How, what, what is the strategy or is why, there one? Why? No, there has to be a strategy and there is a strategy. Yeah, I mean, a I rhetorical think, question. Yeah, I mean, I think the strategy has to be one, to be consistent. We've seen that this wishy-washy mixture, a little bit of freedom here, a little bit of freedom there, 
doesn't win. It's, it's, we've lost We're trying to do that. We have to be more consistent. We have to be more radical. We have to actually stand for freedom and liberty in all realms of human life, not pick and choose the realms in which we feel more comfortable talking about. But we have to be much more consistent in terms of that. And then I think we have to become the defenders of reason. We have to become the defenders of individualism and the individual capacity to reason for himself. We need to become the defenders of truth, the defenders of science, but science properly understood. And you know, it's only if we defend reason as the fundamental means of human knowledge and the individual as the entity that reasons and therefore the entity that has moral sway, that has agency, so two things we have to defend. It's what the Enlightenment defended, reason and individualism. And if we can defend the reason and individualism, we win. We have to complete what the Enlightenment started. The Enlightenment started us on the path, or the Renaissance through the Enlightenment started us on the path of reason and individualism. We need to continue on that path. We've, we've abandoned, I think many people on the liberal side have abandoned those ideas and have become more, much more wishy-washy about them or just focused on economics or just focused on this. We need to embrace the Enlightenment more fully and I think more consistently, and, and here I, I still encourage people to, to read Ayn Rand and to take it more seriously. Uh, you know, I, I, I wonder what the world would be like today if people like Hayek and von Mises and Milton Friedman had taken Rand more seriously. I think we'd be much more closer to uh, uh, a free society than we are right now. I think our voices would be much more powerful if they had. Yaron, thank you so much for giving me your time, giving My pleasure. Uh, the, uh, the, the supporters and viewers of the IEA your time. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.